to welcome everyone um, to the plenary session, um, roundtable discussion, working nine to five in your pajamas, uh, life in the time of COVID-19. Um, uh, presenting today or speaking on the panel will be John Fudro from the University of Pittsburgh Libraries, or a young University of North Carolina at Charlotte Graduate School, Elise Fox and Dana Dickman from Sacramento State University Library. Um, your moderators today are myself, Terry Green from the University of Toledo, and Stacy Wallace. And I don't know if Stacy is on here yet. I don't hear her. Um, so um, I will just continue to go along. Um, so before we begin, um, during the presentation portion, just keep your microphone or phones muted unless you're a speaker. Uh, please feel free to use the chat feature to pose questions. Those are going to be addressed during the Q&A portion. Um, and then, um, so I'd like to welcome everyone. And I'm going to go ahead and um, start asking um, each presenter a question that they all received already. Um, so let me do that. Okay, so um, Dana, Elise, um, John, uh, am I missing anyone? Whoever wants to answer first, um, you're each going to be asked to answer what is the most surprising change in your work life and your home life since March? I'm Elise Fox here. I can go ahead and get us started. Um, I'm the library services specialist for digital projects at Sacramento State University. Uh, I would say probably the biggest uh, change has been I had these preconceived notions that I was a homebody and wanted to work remotely. I am neither of those things. <laughs> um, as a mom uh, with a toddler, um, I didn't realize how much I really relied upon going to work and that process of, you know, that I guess the ritual of going to work and that commuting time to myself and even just having the social interaction of being with adults. Um, and even if you're not um, personally socializing at work, you know, the social aspect of, um, you know, working on projects together and being able to talk through, um, you know, bibliographic problems, <laughs> you know, fulfilled a social quota that's been uh, very hard to replace in a remote environment, um, especially out here in California. We've had incredibly strict um, guidelines under COVID. Um, and recently with all of the wildfires, um, we haven't even been able to leave our house on a lot of days. Um, so it's just been, you know, there's always something, you know, new, new challenge um, underneath this kind of umbrella of the COVID pandemic challenge. Um, so, so yeah, I think um, that transition to, to working exclusively remotely and not having that direct social interaction has been definitely a challenge. Um, you know, my, my email box now is a, a very convoluted hierarchy of folders and subfolders just to keep everything organized. Um, so, so just kind of a, that readjustment to, to entirely um, email or app-based communication. Um, has definitely been um, a lesson in organization. Um, I also transitioned immediately to uh, going from having one student assistant to having 45 student assistants who are also themselves transitioning to uh, remote schoolwork and remote work. Um, so that was a huge learning curve um, and was definitely a challenge to keep that many people um, on the ship I was sailing as we kind of did these trial and trial and errors and you know resolve technology issues um, that come with rem you know remote uh, remote work so so I think those are <laughs> I don't know if <laughs> that solves any problems but uh, you know that's kind okay. of my experience and the surprise that I just didn't really anticipate happening with working remotely or I didn't think it all through I guess Right, right. Thank you so much, Elise, for sharing that with us. Um, Aura, can you go next? Um, yeah, well, um, I can relate to some of those 
problems a little bit. I'm a single mom, I have an eight year old and fortunately I am an introvert. So I love working at home. <laughs> it's great. Um, and uh, the biggest surprise I think was um, uh, I've actually been pretty good at facilitating online events and my supervisors are super happy about that. I conducted an orientation um, panel the other day that almost 800 students attended um, and I never would have thought I would have done anything <laughs> like that um, but um, but it has been it's been pretty challenging and um, it's going to feel really weird when we get back um, part-time in person soon. Thanks so much Aura. Um, Ali? Are you still on the on the phone? Oh, Dana? Oh, Dana. Okay. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, so I have a new challenge, which is trying to attend and present at a conference with the electricity out, which I feel like at work, there would be some more options than what I have right now. But I had been at Sac State for about six months when we went home. And my prior job was actually primarily remote for a hospital system, where our library department was based across seven states. So I honestly didn't think it would feel like a huge change to work from home, but I was really wrong. My prior job was set up to be remote and coming home this time, this was a huge adjustment for my colleagues because our library is very place-based. We are very much like a nine to five sort of library as far as staff. I mean, obviously we're open longer than that. Um, the biggest change in my work life was, has been how complicated it's been to collaborate outside my department because this was all new for us as a university. So I've been running into things like not everyone keeps their out Outlook calendar up to date. They don't all use the same communication platforms. So I can't just send out a calendar invite for a meeting like I could at my old remote job. I have some colleagues where I have to like go back and forth on email a couple times. Um, Elise and I, our department uses Slack, but our reference and instruction department uses Teams. So part of my job requires working with people in that department, but I'm not on the same platform as them. Um, and then there's, you know, of course, complications working with folks outside the library. Um, I think another thing has been a lot of the people I work with are parents who are extra stressed since our K through 12 districts are still mostly remote as well. Um, but on the whole, I am definitely lucky because I came into this with remote experience and tech savvy, and I have a job that transfers really well to being remote uh, with pretty minor adjustments. I think the biggest change in my home life has just been how stir crazy I've been. Elise has mentioned we've had wildfires and smokes so and not being able to go outside and like when I worked remotely before, I would often split up my day by working at cafes or libraries or just going for a walk. Um, and of course, that's not as possible now. I, you know, I can take walks, but that's about it. So this is just really not normal times, not normal working remote. Um, I, I do love being able to do things like cook at home, do laundry at home during work. And yeah, I am lucky that I have a dedicated office space and I don't have child care or child teaching to juggle. Thank you so much, Dana, for sharing. And I think I saw John on here. If you uh, would like to share with us the most surprising thing to you since March. Um, yeah, sure. I guess the, the most surprising for me, I, I, probably the antithesis to Elise is sort of, a, I am also an introverted person in heart. Um, and we had recently moved into an open office setting, uh, and our office shifted. And that was completely what I didn't like um, at the time. And it was all very interruptive. We were close to a large uh, computer lab area where people would ask questions. And, and so being able to shift into uh, be able to set my own sort of um, timing for when I'm working on what project here. Uh, my daughter's also in middle school. So having that ability to help her with her projects uh, and step away during the day so I didn't have to have this sort of asynchronous with her um, was, was very positive. But I think the other side of it in terms of just work in general, um, 
being able to find the policies and procedures and things that weren't necessarily codified or put it in place somewhere that this is how this should work uh, and be able to try and get those down in writing and post them somewhere and, and discuss them with the team and, and sort of iron out the, the issues that have been lingering for years. Uh, and a lot of our processes uh, has been really positive. So I hate to say that it took a, a disaster to, to bring about change in, in small things, but uh, it's a nice time to refresh and sort of do a, a cleaning house, you know, uh, <laughs> in, that, in that regard. So, yeah. Awesome. Um, now, all of our uh, panel presenters today also received a, a list of, of possible topics that they could, you know, expound on. Um, so since we already have John, John, do you want to um, just lead the pack and let us know, you know, a little more information about one of the questions? Sure. Um, let's see. I mean, I wrote them down so we can take a look here. I guess I'll probably look at the one that what does the future look like in terms of, of libraries or in terms of ETDs or what have you. Uh, I think a larger sense is my hope in, in general is to, to take a look at what we're how we uh, structure our staff environments and the way we set up interactions and, and uh, manage projects, things of that nature. I think we definitely at Pitt, I know we had this problem that some departments had sort of remote uh, policies where, where faculty could work remotely, very few staff could. Um, and I hope that this brings about the ability to allow managers and, and administrators to make decisions that are a little more flexible uh, and realize that, you know, we had, I think, eight or nine people in a very small room as an open office where half of those could have worked remotely. We would save time, save energy. Uh, and, and I hope that that sort of echoes throughout the rest of the environments and, and how we facilitate uh, our, our uh workshops and our presentations and what have you uh, to realize that there's there's more than just a building and we can still make things work and be quite as efficient even if we're not all standing next to each other in arm's length um, that hopefully that brings about some of those change I don't think it's going to change overnight necessarily once we all start to get back to a normalization of, of what we <laughs> had as our previous uh, lives but um, I think we, we definitely are realizing uh, that we can do a lot more um, in a hybrid setting um, without interrupting the larger scale, scale of things. So. Thanks a lot, John. Um, Heidi, um, we just heard from Dana that her power's back on. Yay. I'm on it. Yep. Okay. I'm on it. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you would be. Um, so now we get to see your lovely face. Hello. <laughs> um, Dana, if you would like to um, share your response to one of the questions that I sent out, that would be great. Yeah. Um, so I'm just grabbing my notes. This was a little hectic. Um, so I think similar to what the last panelist was saying, I'm really hoping that the future will include more flexibility with remote work, flexible schedules. I know at least my, uh, the library at our campus is in, has been like very anti-remote work and anti-flexible scheduling. And it seemed to largely be from a place of distrust. So I'm really hoping that administration sees how dedicated everyone is and how well everyone is working during this time so that when we can go back, we'll have some more ability. Um, I'm also hoping the future looks like less meetings. I know for me coming from a work environment that was set up to be remote, when I came to Sac State, just the amount of meetings was crazy to me. Um, and I really think that being remote is showing us more effective ways to communicate and empowering people to have more autonomy with their projects since, you know, it's, we can't like walk over to someone's desk or check in with someone at their office. Um, I've also really been into strategies for balancing work home life. Like I think because I did have this background, right, of working remotely and I saw a lot of my colleagues not having good boundaries around that. So I'm really strict on setting my work hours, you know, just like a, any job there's some days I do work a little longer, but otherwise I am working eight to 530, just like before. Um, I turned off, part of that was turning off my email notices on my phone because I would get emails from other librarians at 10 at night. And, you know, that wasn't something I wanted to feel like I had to respond to. Now that we're back in session, 
And I do have some liaison responsibilities with our College of Ed. I'm planning to add in my signature, my working hours, just so that's clear that this is when I'm available and this is when you can expect responses. Thank you so much, Dana. Um, could we have um, Elise next? Sure, um, I definitely, uh, um, you know, everything that, you know, John and Dana have both said, I definitely feel very, <laughs> those are those are excellent recommendations I would make myself. I would also add too that, um, uh, you know, for instance, you know, I don't have the, the option of having a home office. My home office is a nursery and an office and kind of a storage space because we are currently living in a, you know, very small quarters. Um, so I don't get to have that ability to like shut a door and walk away <laughs> from work. Um, but what has helped is making sure that at least my little work area um, meets all of my needs, um, especially ergonomically. So if you haven't done so already, you know, working with whoever you need to, to make sure you're, you can bring home your desktop computers. Uh, that was a huge game changer for me rather than just working on the laptop. Um, I also, I did have to pay out of pocket. The university wouldn't um, pay for it, but I did purchase, you know, a pretty, pretty reasonably priced um, uh, tabletop converter so that I can convert into a standing desk, which has also been incredibly helpful. So just anything that you can do to just, you know, if even if you don't have like a little you know, a, a room that is exclusively for your work, just making your little workspace uh, work as best as you can for you. Um, I know we're actually going to be remotely through next semester also, so <laughs> that's a lot of time to be spending at home. Um, and I know not everyone's in that boat, but just even those little minor adjustments can really help to, to stay focused and stay energized and engaged. Thanks a lot, Elise. Aura? Uh, well, as I was thinking about um, changes going forward or, or what changes um, we've had that hopefully will remain the same, um, our graduate school has always been really strict about no remote um, participation during um, thesis and dissertation defenses, um, especially for the chair or um, the, the outside members actually needed to be there. And of course the student uh, and all the paperwork needed to be signed by hand and like carried over to the graduate school. Although, although finally it got to the point where people could actually email me stuff. So that was nice. Um, but then, you know, all of a sudden we had to go remote and lo and behold, somehow the world did not end with people defending remotely. <laughs> And um, they managed to get their um, electronic signatures on their, on their documents, um, sometimes, and uh, got the documents to me. And um, everybody got graduated in the spring and in the summer. Um, so um, now we have finally instituted DocuSign for our documents instead of just relying on the Adobe um, signature feature. Um, and um, in future, I hope, I think that um, the grad school will continue to be flexible about remote participation, especially when we have obviously faculty members and students all over the world doing research, doing all kinds of things. Um, I think it's really impractic impractical to um, require that everybody come to campus. It's so difficult for scheduling and it's just a pain for everyone. So I think this has been a good thing to come out of this. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we've um, started getting some chat comments going. And so, you know, if you have questions um, or, or ideas or thoughts, um, please go ahead and share them. I'll go ahead and share some of the uh, conversation prompt questions um, in just a second because now my computer is freezing up. <laughs> okay, hold on. Sorry. I think uh, one of the questions would be, um, you know, what, what would be the best piece of advice maybe that you could give to other ETD professionals? Um, so, I mean, this is addressed to our panelists, but also, 
you know, I'd invite our participants to, you know, offer their uh, suggestions in the chat window um, because all the chats are going to be, you know, recorded and available for everyone. So, um, yeah. So what advice can you offer? Um, so I had, oh, sorry. I, no, I had thought about this. So I'm based in the library and we obviously work with our Office of Graduate Studies around ETDs. Um, and our library is in the midst of migrating to a new institutional repository platform where our ETDs will be housed. And I would say if you work with another department in any way, give yourself way more time than you think because you don't know what's going on in their department, what things might need to happen on their end. And it just seems like we're going to need way more time than perhaps what we had originally thought. I know I've had experiences, not with Office of Graduate Studies, but with our archival collections where, because so many things need signatures, we've had to figure out workarounds for that, whether that's using something like DocuSign or our institution uses Adobe Sign, which is a similar platform. Um, or we've been moving things to web forms um, where we don't need a wet signature, but we need them to acknowledge something. And, you know, if, if we need a web form created at our library, we have to ask the one guy at the library who does that, who has a million IT related projects. Thanks, Dana. Any, any of our other panelists have a, a choice piece of advice to give? <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I would say that one of the very similar to that is to sort of get a landscape idea of what is going on in the university, what changes have been made, um, understanding what, what maybe you are, haven't been made aware of a new technology or new application or some new change to a policy uh, in your IT division, if they have that, uh, that sort of um, ability to figure that out because if they've added some new service that you can take advantage of and integrate into a service that you've already been doing and perhaps in an analog way, um, you might be able to sort of uh, outsource that to, to their expertise uh, and find a better solution than you, than you initially thought of. I know we've had similar things with that going on where we were lucky enough to get Zoom as a license quite quickly and able to transition uh, certain aspects of our workshops and things like that to different environments. So it's really being able to reach out and find connections in the university landscape to say, how else can we try to solve this problem uh, and not try to do everything yourself? Uh, like we tend to do that, at least we do at Pitt. We've also often tried to reinvent the wheel um, a million times over uh, instead of asking for others to, who can help us uh, and, and be partners in, in a solution rather than the only ones uh, trying to think up a new idea. So uh, that's my, my big piece of this is really to say, look for support in your organization. You're probably going to find it now uh, because everybody's stressed. Everybody has to make changes um, and don't be afraid to ask. Uh, it sounds odd, but... <laughs> Thanks a lot, John. I know I'm the moderator, but I just wanted to add something um, to kind of, you know, um, add on to that. And that is, you know, a lot of universities, um, you know, have lost a lot of staff positions. And so people that you may have collaborated with or, you know, had to work with, you know, on a regular basis may not be there anymore. Um, so it's always a good idea to just kind of keep up, you know, keep monitoring, um, you know, who it is that you work with. Um, yeah, because that's what we've discovered <laughs> at the University of Toledo. Anybody else would like to share a piece of advice? Okay, how about this? What big question do you have for other ETD professionals? Um, I guess I'm just personally interested to know what other, uh, like what projects or opportunities have arisen as a result of this um, pandemic. Um, for example, you know, Dana and I will be presenting on our 508 compliance project that we would have never had the opportunity to do at the scale we're doing um, unless there was a pandemic situation. 
Um, but you know, our repository is still far from perfect and I'm definitely always interested in, in hearing what other projects um, people are doing to either remediate content or, or metadata in order to enhance um, discoverability and access to documents. Thank you so much. I know um, participants are sharing, you know, what systems they're using and, and steps that they're taking. So please just keep sharing. Um, anybody else with question for other people? Aura, Dana? Um, I just wanted to respond to, let's see, Josefina Green's question about kind of casual contact with grad students. I, because I was answering a reference question for someone, saw that our Office of Graduate Studies essentially has their Zoom open during business hours for drop-in. Because I'm not in that department, I can't comment on how frequently it's being used, but that's one thing I've seen. I, I was, I saw that, that question there as well, and I was sort of thinking, um, you know, I work in the Center for Graduate Life, which is within the graduate school, but we provide professional development programming and writing support and all sorts of different things. So we have lots of opportunities to interact with the students. And at the, um, let me see, at the beginning of COVID, the graduate school had to send, send out a survey to all the graduate students and ask them what they're struggling with and what they need. Mm -hmm. And they, um, the grad school went through the responses and tried to figure out if they could help anybody financially or, you know, what, what they could do. And now we're sort of like working on another similar survey um, right now because um, now that the semester has started, a lot, have, a lot of students have said that they're really overwhelmed. Um, so we kind of want to figure out why they're so overwhelmed exactly and see what we can do. Um, so. I don't know, I guess um, a survey sounds funny, but that might actually be a good way to connect with your students. Um, and then, you know, for myself, I use um, like a, a booking website. So if students want to make an appointment with me, they just go to the website and make an appointment um, or talk to me on the phone. So we do, um, you know, like formatting support that way and in groups as well. So that's just a few things that we do to keep in touch. Well, yeah, I, I would like to add on to that as well. I mean, I saw the uh, question about the other schools having a special graduation period. I know at Pitt we did have an extended spring semester um, deadlines that went throughout the summer. Um, which was a slight interruption, obviously, to, to um, the schedules and how things were running, but we were able to facilitate that and communicate it out through. Um, some of the other changes we made, uh, similar to what Aura was saying, that we used uh, SpringShare software to uh, allow for people to book consultations um, with uh, myself and uh, my, uh, some of my colleagues in the in ETD support um, realm of things here. So we could allow the students who normally would walk in into our office or, or kind of sit down with us at our desk uh, to schedule a Zoom meeting that way uh, and trying to, to keep our avenues open for questions and availability there. Uh, it, it's been interesting to see that change. And we have a, a million things are, and projects coming up. Uh, we, and I'll be talking about that in my presentation later. Uh, we had already scheduled out phases to things we were going to be looking at in terms of uh, the ETD process at Pitt. Uh, but some of them have kind of cropped up uh, rather quickly um, because we, we had to make changes uh, to what we were already thinking. And some of them are, are basically, what do we do with ETDs that aren't PDFs? Or what do we consider those sorts of, of documents and, and sort of uh, files? And what can we do with those in our institutional repository, which we're also looking to change uh, in the next few years? So when it rains, it pours, I suppose, for us right now. But um, looking at how we do on, online forms for milestones within the student systems, uh, what we can change with the, the, the committee forms and the way they do remote uh, committee defenses. Uh, all the things we've heard are, are probably going to be a lot of people are dealing with and hopefully we can get together and find solutions that worked. Um, we're still stepping through a lot of those hoops right now to figure out what's going to be the best solution. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a matter of uh, doing sort of a process audit in a lot of ways here where we're looking to say what, what has been done, uh, what can we do, uh, and, and what happens the next time something interrupts the services? Uh, and what if, what if a platform goes away? What if support for a platform goes away or services? Uh, what, what are the alternatives we can use? So um, disaster uh, management, I guess, is some of the <laughs> skill we didn't know we were going to need in repositories. And, um. 
Thanks a lot, John. Um, I'm reading a question here from Larry. Um, Larry says that they conduct ETD mixers training sessions um, using Zoom for the first time. Um, it was Q&A, worked great. And so if, if Larry can unmute himself and share, you know, did you get more participation through the Zoom than you maybe normally would have, you know, for a, a training session? Uh, yes, actually, I got a tremendous turnout. Uh, we had the best turnout for our students uh, this particular Zoom session than we've ever had before. Uh, I would say it was almost double. And we also had more faculty this time in the session as well. Um, what was really, uh, I felt, was the thing that was most important in terms of the Q&A was posting what we would normally do in stand-up presentations and talking with the students. We did that using video prior to the mixer, almost a week prior to the mixer, and we posted it to a Blackboard discussion thread, which had the ability for the students to actually ask questions before we got to the Q&A. Uh, that was extremely helpful. And because we were able to review the questions, uh, questions that we might have had a problem or stumbled over during a, a live session, we were able to deal with very well in that way. So it, it went very smoothly. Uh, we cut down our actual time in terms of the live video, uh, the Zoom video piece from three hours to one hour. And we were finished. And I've got, got a lot of good feedback from the students on it as well. That's fantastic. That is fantastic. <clears throat> So um, I'm curious, Larry, or anyone who um, have, you know, gone to new modes of operation, whether it's, you know, virtual defenses or, or virtual training, uh, what do you think, I mean, when, when life gets back to being on campus again, or, or relatively normal, non-pandemic, how do you, antici do you anticipate going back to the way things were? what do you think is going to remain changed for the better? Hey everyone, this is Tim Watson from the Graduate School at Ohio State. Um, hey Terry, um, I'm gonna second Aura's comments from earlier in that we were very strict about no remote defenses. Uh, students had to be on campus. Um, format reviews had to be done in person. Uh, we do format reviews of their documents at the time of the defense for the PhD students, so they had to come into the office to do that. Uh, the cat is out of the bag and all that is gone, as, as far as I'm concerned, and I think uh, the, it, the uh, graduate school administration would, would feel the same way. Um, we are moving forward to using a uh, online format review system. Uh, we're actually adopting a bit of Vireo, to be honest, for that. Um, and um, so we'll be doing that. The remote exams will take place. Um, we will encourage, we will allow hybrid exams, all remote, all on campus, whatever, whatever happens. So, um, so those things have, have changed, uh, changed dramatically. And I think it'll be interesting to see going forward, just how much uh, will we see students in person? Um, that was, you know, a, a big influx for us. I'm actually back to work. Um, we are working part-time back on campus. So I am on campus today. Um, I've been back for over a month, uh, working three days a week on campus. And uh, I've seen three students and it's been the same student the whole time. Uh, she keeps coming back for more questions. But other than that, it's going to be interesting to see how this, uh, how this impacts things going forward with whether students will uh, come in or whether we will continue to do a lot more remote. And I think it's going to be a lot more remote. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that too. Um, at a prior position, I worked with students with disabilities around their accommodation requests. Um, and there was oftentimes a lot of resistance to things that are now very much the norm, right? Like, so the last person was speaking about doing things more remotely. And I feel like there had always been such pushback, especially to students with disability needs around those things. And I really am hoping that that is something that stays, that we continue 
with these things that were special accommodations before where students felt like they had to really justify and then were often turned down anyways. Like, I just hope we become more accessible as a result of this. Thank you so much, Dana. I, I agree with um, the comment that this is a very important issue. Um, and in fact, uh, for OhioLINK, um, we are looking at a major requirement to make our ETDs accessible. And so uh, this is kind of a major undertaking. Um, but like you say, it's more than just making an ETD, you know, it's more than making a document accessible. It's about how do you support and serve your students. Um, well, we only have about four minutes left. Um, so I would just like to thank all of our panelists and our participants. Um, you know, if you have any more comments or questions, get them in the chat as soon as you can. <laughs> Um, and then um, at 1.50, so three minutes now, uh, we'll be taking a quick break and we'll also have some sponsor messages right here in the same room that you're in. Um, and then after that, um, at 1.55, we'll do the breakout sessions. Um, so I think, um, I think I'd like to just go ahead and wrap this up. If anybody has any from the panelists, if anybody has any final words to say, go ahead. Oh, just thank you for having us. It's been nice to, if anything, commiserate about our experiences. I don't see anybody in their pajamas though. So I don't know how accurate this panel was, but you know. <laughs> I can't, I can't speak for myself because, you know, I may be wearing pajama bottoms. We don't know. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, thank you so much again. And um, we'll go ahead and um, take our break and do the sponsor messages. Thank you. <laughs>